What's going on, Journey? It's good to see you this morning. I want to welcome all of our campuses, Twinsburg Ferry Park, uh, Journey Avon. It's so good to be with you this morning. And can we give a round of applause for all those that are joining us online? Thank you for joining us today. Today it's Palm Sunday, uh, the week before we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus next Sunday on, or next week on Easter. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you and your wonderful family as well uh, as we celebrate, like I said, the historical event of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, before we jump into today's message on Palm Sunday, I wanna talk about something that's really, really important. You know, one thing that we believe as a church is that we are called to be Christ followers, that discipleship and Christ-likeness is really the goal, uh, and we have really wanted to help equip you to take your next step and grow in your walk with God, that we've, we have what we call the path, and the path is really our discipleship pathway or process to help you go deeper into the things of God. Our prayer is that you'll be a mile wide and a mile deep uh, in your relationship with the Lord. Uh, but we're also rolling out what we call path workshops. Why don't you fist pump your neighbor and say, you need to do this. Path workshops. I'm gonna put a little slide up on the screen and uh, a little QR code. If you'll scan that QR code, uh, it will provide for you a list of six path workshops that are coming up that, are, that go over, they range from, uh, they go up to six weeks. Uh, path workshops, and there's a variety of topics to help you, like I said, grow in your walk with God. Now, the wonderful thing about being a follower of Christ is that it's your walk. The bad thing about it is I can't make you do it, right? Uh, but I'm trying to put salt in your oats, right? To help you wanna to move forward and drink the water, so to speak. And this is an opportunity for you if you're married, your relationship, or if you're dating somebody, maybe your whole small group wants to go through a workshop. There is limited space for each workshop. Go ahead and scan that QR code, find out the topics and how to RSVP your, your spot, and I promise you your life will be changed, amen? Amen. Hey, if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, that's gonna be one of our key texts for today as we're talking about the triumphal, triumphal entry of Jesus. If you don't have your Bibles, it will be up on the screen here. It says that they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Now, this is right after Jesus uh, raised Lazarus from the dead, an incredible miracle. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, Jesus told them to get a colt, an unridden colt, that he might ride it into the city. It's pretty significant that he rode a colt and, um, and, and not a horse. We'll talk about that here in a minute as well. And it says, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others uh, cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. Now, this is important because this actually speaks back to an event that took place 200 years prior to Jesus. It was actually another triumphal entry by Judas Maccabeus. Now Judas Maccabeus was a high priest and he also has some military um, experience and passion that he led a revolt against the religious and political power of the day and to reclaim the temple. And he did reclaim the temple uh, temporarily. Uh, and then it went, the people of God, the Jewish people, went back into oppression again from the, from the uh, political uh, pressure of the dead. So this is symbolic of that moment. This is actually a second triumphal entry. Uh, Judas Maccabeus actually had another one. So these people gather together and they're waving these palm branches in the air, okay? Just like they did with Judas Maccabeus 200 years prior, BC. And they're waving these branches in the air and they're throwing their cloaks and maybe some little rugs on the, on the, on the ground uh, signifying Jesus, uh, your royalty. Your, your power, and we believe that you're gonna do something great. And just like Judas Maccabeus uh, tried to overthrow the political power, we believe that you're gonna overthrow the Roman Empire because Judas Maccabeus wasn't the Messiah, but, but you are. You're gonna do an incredible thing, okay? So they're waving these branches. The, the other reason they wave these branches is because they weren't allowed to have weapons, they weren't allowed to have swords or any kind of uh, daggers or anything like that. So they had these palm branches, almost like uh, uh, it was symbolism and almost like code. Hey, uh, Judas Maccabeus, we were told him that we're gonna fight and with him. And now Jesus, we're gonna do the exact same thing, okay? So this is happening right here. That's a little bit of the history. And the crowds went ahead of him to those that followed shadow, Hosanna, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest of heaven. Now, why did they go before him? It's because they heard about Lazarus. There was like a forerunner that went ahead and before Jesus got there, they told him, Jesus just raised Lazarus, who was in the grave, not for one, two, or three days. He was in the grave for four days. 
and he called him forth, and man, this great miracle happened. So everyone's just like, oh my gosh, this is someone better than Judas Maccabeus. This is incredible, right? And they're shouting, Hosanna in the highest. The whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Some people didn't know, right? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So they're, they're totally jacked out of their mind. They're just ready for this miracle to take place and that they're gonna bring uh, uh, relief and freedom to them, just like Judas Maccabeus did temporarily, but we're, we're believing that Jesus, you're the guy that's gonna do it forever and we're letting you know that we're with you by waving these palm branches. They had an expectation of Jesus to do what they hoped that he would do based on their experience based on what they had heard prior from their families, 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 roommates, cousins, friends, roommate, right? And they heard that Judas Maccabeus did this and Jesus is gonna do it in our time. They had great expectations of Jesus. Hey, have, have you ever had expectations of Jesus, right? Have you ever prayed? And when you prayed in your mind, you kind of thought this is how he's gonna answer it or this is how he should answer it. Or, 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 or I gave today in the offering, surely Monday I should get a $10,000 check breakthrough. Come on, Jesus. All right? Well, let me show you something. Uh, this is our expectation in life, right? We just think everything's up. You know, I'm gonna make the choice and it's just, it's just gonna be gravy. It's gonna be amazing. My finances will always grow up. My relationship will always be up. Always up and to the right, gonna crush it. But how many that are older know that life is like this? Right? I see all these Ned's heads nodding and all these young whippersnappers. No, this can't be true. Your reality, false expectation, reality. How many know this phrase is true? Everything changes what? Everything, right? We have hopes and plans and desires, but very rarely do they ever roll out the way that we expect. I'm pretty confident 99% of my life has not turned out any way that I expected. But it has turned out exactly the way that God wants it to turn out, amen? We can trust him and take it to the bank that he'll do what he said he's gonna do. Now, these people had False expectation, let me just go to a little side. When we have false expectation upon our spouse, upon our circumstances, uh, upon ourselves, it leads to something. It leads to frustration. It leads to disappointment. It leads to anxiety. It can lead to depression. It could lead to hopelessness. Uh, let me show you what I mean. When we have false expectation and then reality hits, remember reality is this, okay? When false expectations, everything's gonna go perfect, I'm gonna get married, it's gonna be uh, moonbeams and unicorns and wonderful stuff, then all of a sudden you find out, uh-oh, we're different. We like the toilet paper this way, you like the toilet paper that way, right? The degree of your false expectations to the dis uh, distance to your reality is the degree of your level of frustration or your discouragement, or your anxiety, or your depression, or your hopelessness. It will challenge you and impede your progress forward because of your false expectation. Are you tracking with me? Now, the people that we just read about actually had a false expectation. Jesus, you're gonna do this, and here's the deal. When he didn't, what did they do? What did they do? They crucified him. They got angry. You came in on a cult. You came in fulfilling the scriptures in the Old Testament. And how dare you not do what we expected you to do in the time frame by which we wanted you to do it. You know what? You deserve to die. We're gonna have let Barabbas out of the way, but we're gonna get you because you didn't do what you said you would do. And you made us look like a fool when we cut those branches and we laid down our robes. We feel like a fool and you're gonna pay for it. You know what, God, you didn't do what, you wanted me, what I wanted you to do, so I'm not going to church anymore. You didn't do what I wanted to do when you didn't come through financially for me. I'm not tithing anymore. I'll show you that. Mm. I'm not gonna read my Bible anymore. It creates this frustration and anxiety inside of us because we have a false expectation of God. So how do we have a healthy expectation on this triumphal entry Sunday, on this Palm Sunday? 
Well, I think instead of going with what people say or what you say or TikTok says about God, uh, what if we went and said, what does Jesus say about himself? I wanna cover 66 things that Jesus says about himself. I'm kidding, no, she, she was like, what? <laughs> we'll have intermission. So let's go through the first one. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Let's look at the verse. I am the resurrection and the life, and the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Now, this is really good news. I am the resurrection and the life. Where was this said? This was said when he raised Lazarus from the dead right before the triumphal entry. So let's go to that story for a moment. Now, Lazarus, a, a man named Lazarus, they were buddies, by the way. They grew up together. Mary and Martha and all these people were hanging out. They were, they were like familia, right? He was sick. Uh, he was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Hey, the guy you hung out with and played kickball with, dodgeball with, he's not doing well. And I know you love him, and you're gonna give him VIP treatment, so we're gonna let you know you need to get here ASAP because your buddy, you know, your bromance you guys got, you need to get here really, really quick. He's gonna die. Now look, let's, let's, look at, let's look at Jesus' response. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. I think that's great news for you. Some of you are like, hey, Jesus, I just lost my job. Hey, Jesus, I want, uh, hey, my spouse, we ain't doing good right now. We're kind of like roommates in the house. Hey, hey, Jesus, my kids, man, my kids are going through rebellion right now, and I want to just, you know what I want to do. Hey, Jesus, um, uh, my faith walk with you every time I pray, I just feel like you don't hear me and you don't really care and you feel like you're far off. Hey, Jesus, I, I just, I don't think life's fair. The doctor said this to me. I think God's word to us on this triumphal entry is like, hey, what you're going through is not gonna end in death. What you're going through, in other words, is not, listen to me, is not, is not the final say over your life, yeah. right? That's what we know through the death and resurrection. What does he say? Death, where is your sting? In other words, death is not the final say. This is what he's saying, I am the resurrection. In other words, whatever area of your life you think is written off, it is not the final say on your life or over your life. That's what he's saying. But, but what you're going through, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, God's gonna work it out for your good and his glory. That's right there is for God's glory so that God's son might be glorified through it. Now, I kind of wish this wasn't true. I kind of like, God, why do I have to go through pain? Why do I have to go through trials and tribulations? It's through those things, which we live in a fallen world, it's through those things that it points to God that there's a risen savior that gets you and helps you through them, around them, or over them. And it points to a dying world that's dying without Jesus that there is hope in someone much greater. Amen? Let's go on. So why do we have these expectations that God won't do this? Well, in our story, there are three, three types of people that we're gonna look at in this story that they could not see that Jesus was the hope or that Jesus was gonna bring life to a hopeless situation because of their expectations. Three people. Let's look at the first one. First, we have a hard time receiving it, that he, he is the resurrection, because we're dead in our doubts. Now, we see this in Thomas. Thomas, you have heard the phrase, doubting Thomas. He was a guy that when Jesus rose from the get dead, uh, he was like, I'm not gonna believe it unless I put my finger into the side of his side where the sword went. There's no way. And I put my fingers into the scars and the holes in his hands. Doubting Thomas. He was a doubter then, and he's a doubter here. Then Thomas, also noticed Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When? Life's not fair. It's not gonna work out. This job isn't gonna work out. My marriage, oh, here it goes. Oh, man, my, I'm always gonna be a failure. I'm always gonna date the wrong person. Why even hope? Because this is a lot of life that I'm given. It's one cycle after the next. It's never gonna end. Life sucks. It will continue to suck. And I always think in my whole life, everyone else gets the, the advance, but I get the short end of the stick. When? And this is doubting Thomas. How many know a doubting Thomas in your life? It's like they suck the very hope out of the atmosphere. That was a great service. 
Yeah, but I don't like that song. I feel like that was emotionalism. You're an idiot. <laughs> Next one is this. Dead in your discouragement. Can't receive that Jesus is the resurrection because of discouragement. This is found in Mary. Mary had some challenges. Look at it. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary, what did she do? She stayed at home. She was discouraged. Why? False expectation will lead to hopelessness and discouragement. I had a hope that Jesus would come right away, but Joker Man waited four days. I'm so discouraged that, man, now I got the bill from the bank and they're foreclosing. Jesus, what's going on? Why are you waiting to the 11th, 12th? It's 1 a.m. Discouragement. She was dead in her delay. Why is it? Let me tell you, delay does not mean God's denial over your life. Just because God doesn't come through in your time frame doesn't mean he's not going to come through. He will come through in his time frame, in his way. Why? For he, your good and his glory. That's hard news. I don't like that. I kind of feel like Jesus to move a little faster. Does anyone else think that he should move a little faster? It's me like, I'm not raising my hand. There's no way I'm raising my hand. God will see it, right? What about this one, dead in delay? That's Martha. Discouragement and now delay. Martha is just frustrated. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, I just wanna, let's be practical. Let's get real practical. You might not know this, but when someone dies, something begins to happen. Now, I know today we embalm bodies and they, they can be preserved for quite a long time. But what happens after one day uh, when something dies? Have you ever had an animal die in your wall or in your attic? Have you ever had that happen? You're like, something stinks in this house, right? Something's going on. All the young people are like, what? Don't worry, you'll have it. <laughs> he goes back to that whole expectation squirrely thing. You're gonna have an animal die in your wall. You know what happens after four days? It stinketh. That's the biblical version. It stinketh. It stinketh big time, all right? So the tomb for four days, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, if you would have listened to my prayer, if you would have saw that I gave when I gave and you responded the way that I wanted you to respond, my expectation, then this whole thing could have been avoided. But because you didn't listen to me, this whole thing stinks. My brother would not have died. But then, look what she says. But I know, even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She's mocking him. She's saying, this didn't turn out the way that I wanted. I mean, but pff, you're in control. I mean, whatever happens, happens. I guess I gotta trust you. She's being facetious about it. Look what Jesus said to her. He said to Martha, your brother will rise again. And Mar she's mocking him again. Answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I know in heaven there's no crying. I, I, I know that there's no weeping and no more tears and there's no more death, and no more cancer, no more anxiety and Prozac and all that. I know that. And Jesus said to her, wait, 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 wait. I am the resurrection and the life. I, I like this part right here because he didn't say, I, I can resurrect. He didn't say, I will resurrect. He said, by the way, um, I am the resurrection. And the one who believes in me, the resurrection, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing me will never die. Now he's mocking her. He's kind of being facetious with her. You wanna play the game? You wanna do that? You wanna, you wanna, you wanna do this? Do you believe me? Do you believe me? Here's what I want you to write down. The resurrection is not an event, it's a person. I think it's worth taking a picture of that. The resurrection is not an event, it's a person. No. Oh, some of you guys aren't done yet, sorry. 
When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice. Now, hold on a second. Before this took place, something phenomenal happened. The stone was rolled away. The stone had been there for four days and no one removed it because it stunk. There are proverbial stones in your life that need to be rolled away. And some of us are afraid to roll it away because it stinks. We just don't wanna reveal it. And the only one that can roll that stone away is Jesus. The only one that can bring, allow that thing to be revealed and it not stink is Jesus. So let me give you some hope here. A lot of us have issues and trauma and things we're dealing with from the past, the present, and maybe we'll pick up along the way in the future. God, at the right time, will deal with what stinks in your life. At the right time. When do you deal with it? When he shows up and addresses it. This is the discipleship life. You know, I'm... following Christ, I'm trying to figure out how long now, I've been following Christ for quite some time, and there are even moments, even though I'm 30 years away from my parents' divorce, divorce of 40 years of my childhood, every now and then, something just kind of gets me. It just kind of gets me, and I'm like, ooh, that's like, it reminds me of that. Ooh, that makes me angry, that's frustrating. I feel sorrow, I feel guilt or condemnation, and I, and I can feel the Holy Spirit say, hey, now's the time to deal with that. But God, I dealt with it 10 years ago, I dealt with it 15 years ago. He's like, yeah, but right now, it's just, it might not be a big stone, but it's a little stone I wanna deal with right now. Or it's another layer I wanna peel back, and, and then what I have to choose to do is lean into it instead of running away from it. Well, I'm afraid to deal with it because it stinks. Yeah, I know, but I'm not gonna judge you for the stink. I'm gonna roll it away, and then he does something profound when when we roll it away, and we reveal the death in our life, whether we think it's small or big. He does something powerful. Here's what he does. The dead man, he said, Lazarus, come out. What does he do? He changes it from death to life. The place that stunk became the place of revival, of resurrection power, because he is the resurrection. The dead man came out and his hands and feet were wrapped up with strips of linen. I mean, how did he get up? I mean, all I know, if I was bound laying down, getting up's pretty hard. <laughs> they even shows you that Jesus even helped get him up. And he said, take all that stuff off. And he said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Here's why, he's free, he doesn't, it doesn't stink anymore. He's free from that one place of bondage and hurt. Here's why. Not only am I able to resurrect your marriage, not only am I able to resurrect your finances, your health, your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health, I can do it because I am the resurrection. I don't just resurrect, I am. So if I'm in your life, then the resurrection power is flowing in you. He's the resurrection. That's an expectation we could take to the bank. Take it to the bank. Why don't you look at your neighbor and tell him, take it to the bank. Type in that chat section, take it to the bank. Let's talk about another expectation we can have of Jesus. It's this one. I like this one. I wanna end on this one. Uh, He's the good shepherd. Everyone say good. Now, if he says good shepherd, he says it right here, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Well, if he's saying good, he's also implying there could be bad shepherds. There could be evil shepherds, shepherds that complicate things, shepherds that don't have the best agenda or are or, or there for the sheep uh, for their service versus the shepherd to lay down his or her life for them, right? You say, hey, listen, I'm the good shepherd. Uh, so let me give you some uh, verses that support this and what the good shepherd says about himself. I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. John 10, 10. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Now, this is really interesting. Let me say something about sheep. Sheep are mentioned 200 times in the Bible, okay? Um, Dogs are mentioned like 44 times. Cats, zero. (laughs) I just have to... 
preach the truth today. Just preach the truth. Let it set you free, people. Set you free. Sheep are interesting. I think sheep are really cute. Personally, I think they're fluffy. I like we get wool from them, they serve a purpose, but there are some qualities and challenges of being a sheep. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say bye. <laughs> because you, my friend, are a sheep. Let me give you four challenges of being a sheep. Here's number one. Sheep get lost easily. We learned this in Isaiah, right? We are like sheep who've all gone astray. We get lost easily. Here's why. We just, we get, oh, look at butterfly. Bah, and we go that direction. <laughs> Squirrel, right? And we had that direction. Oh, look at that glitzy, glamorous thing. Oh, look at that girl over there. Oh, wow, look at that boy. Oh, wow, oh, my own desires. Ah. We get lost. What are you laughing at? That's a pretty good sheep. Ah. I could do a pretty mad cow, but I won't do it here now. Lost sheep. Number two, Sheep are defenseless. Think about it, they don't have horns, they don't have fangs, they don't have vicious claws, uh, none of that stuff, right? They don't have wings where they can fly away. They're just a big cotton ball, you know? And what do they do? The worst thing they can do is bite. And really when a sheep gets in a line, because they all travel in a line, and the, the sheep in front of them slows down and it doesn't keep up pace, what does the sheep do? It bites the other sheep. Sounds exactly like the church. Look at your neighbor. Bah. I'm talking about you today, right? And then, then, if they don't move fast enough, they, what they do is they butt each other with their head. They, they, they butt them. I'm telling you, this is, if this is not the local church, I don't know what is, right? They're, they're defenseless. Next, they're very stubborn. Very, very stubborn. Button heads against each other. They're hard to move. They, they don't listen to the shepherd. Next, they are filthy. Filthy. Sheep do not have the capacity to clean themselves. How do they get clean? The good shepherd. The good shepherd does a few things. Make sure that the, the fur and the head and the ears and their nose and their hoods are clean because they pick up stuff along the way. What a good shepherd actually does, you know the scripture verse says where you anoint my head with oil. It's referring to the good shepherd where the good shepherd would take oil and pour it over the sheep's head and, and massage it into its scalp and sometimes into its fur and rub the oil into its ears and into its nostrils. Why? It was the, the oil was like an ointment that kept flies from laying larva in its ears and in its nose and its fur. And if, if a fly would lay its arva, larva into the sheep's ears, it would drive it crazy and the sheep would actually take its head and pound it against a rock until it killed itself. That anointing, being God's presence, spending time with a good shepherd allows you to have ears to hear. And you don't hear the buzzing of the flies and the gnats and, and the voices that cause you to go to the left and right. There's something about being in God's presence that allows you to hear the singularity of God's voice, the Holy Spirit. That's why he says, don't forsake coming together. Don't forsake allowing the anointing to clean out your ears and keep you the, 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 the ointment in you and on you and around you and keep out the pestilence. What does a good shepherd do? He guides. He guides us. Where does he guide us? He guides me along the path, right paths for his namesake. I just realized this when I put this up here. He guides me along the paths for Jim's sake. It doesn't say that. For his namesake. Because sometimes, if I'm honest with you, 99% of the paths he tells me to take, initially, I don't like them. They're not the paths that I would normally take logically because I have false expectations to go straight up in the air. And he's like, oh no, we're gonna go loop-de-loop -loop up the mountain, around the mountain, through the mountain, and all over again. Why? For his name's sake. Because in that process, he's bringing about the nature of God in me and through me by following and yielding through the process process of God, the process of the good shepherd sees, not what I think is right. It's frustrating to me. 
But normally 99% of the time when I start off following the Lord, I'm like, why are we doing this? But in hindsight, I'm like, thank God I trusted the good shepherd. He is for his namesake and for good things for me. His ways are always better than my ways. The gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherd or the the, the gatekeeper is the shepherd, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name. Oh, I like that. Not by number, not by their attributes, not by their giftings, not how good they go by, but by their name, and it leads them out. Out of what? Fields that were good in one season, but aren't good in this season. Leads them out of trouble. Don't go that way. That way is a destructive way. I'll lead you out if you listen to my voice. And after he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. Know his voice. What does a good shepherd do? He guides, he provides. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. But I relate to this, he makes me. Your pastor has a tendency to not lay down. I just keep striving. Anybody? And sometimes I feel like the Lord's like, hey, listen, if you're not gonna slow down, I'm gonna make you slow down. For my name's sake and for your good. I can't say this enough. You need to take the Sabbath. You need to have breaks. Turn off the social media. Turn off the TV and CNN and Fox. Just turn it off. He leads me inside quiet waters. Why quiet waters? It's because sheep get spooked by loud noises. When waters are rough, they actually won't drink the waters because they're rough and they'll actually dehydrate and die, even though water is right there. He says, listen, when the waters are quiet and calm, you can drink waters when it's calm and safety. He refreshes my soul. One of the greatest epidemics is a weary soul. When your soul is weary, I promise you, your body's weary. You can take as many all-inclusive, come on, Jesus, vacations as you want, and you will always be tired until your soul is refreshed. He corrects. I'm gonna go quickly. Blessed is the one who corrects so he does not despise discipline. So don't despise discipline for the Almighty, from the Almighty. He wounds, but he also binds. He injures, but his hands also heal. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. God, why are you so mean to me? Why won't you let me do what I want to do? You're not fair. It's like, wow, I'm gonna discipline you because I know what's best for you. Finally, he protects. Maybe you know this verse right here. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, it's referring to the sheep, and also the anointing of a king. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of a life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One more, then we'll land the plane. Suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in an open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Why, why, why does he do that? It's because that little lamb keeps wandering off and keeps doing its own thing. And, and the Lord is so patient and says, man, this is the third time I've rescued you. This is the fourth time I've saved you. Here, picks him up, puts him on his shoulder and says, you're gonna stay here until you learn my voice. You're gonna be so close to me in my discipline and my protection, and it's gonna feel like I'm micromanaging you and controlling everything, but it's so you can learn my voice that when I truly let you go, you trust me and stay within the fold where there's protection, there's provision, there's safety. He carries that little lamb, that sheep around until it's healed if it was wounded. He'll bind it up and make sure it's healthy and whole before he puts it back on the This triumphal entry is a day that we celebrate, not our expectations, but we celebrate that Jesus is coming into town to fulfill what he said he's going to do and that he is who he said he is. And we could put bank in it. We can put our confidence and anchors in that knowing it's true. Amen. Why don't you put your hand on your heart? I wanna pray for you before your campus pastor comes. 
Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you that you are the good shepherd. I wanna thank you that you are the resurrection and the life. Lord, there's so many other things that you said that you are that we're simply covering too today. And because of that, we have a triumphal Sunday and week because of who you are, not who we are. Not because of our expectations, but because of what you said. And our expectation is true because it's banked in what you said about yourself. I pray for those that need life to come into areas that are dead in their mind, their emotions, their relationship, their finances. Be who you say you are. For those that need a good shepherd, maybe they viewed you as a bad shepherd or a driving shepherd or a distant shepherd. I pray that today they would receive that you are good and faithful and gentle and loving and caring and providing, compassionate, disciplining, good shepherd. Our trust is in you today. Our trust is in you. Keep your eyes closed, your head bowed as your campus pastor comes.